that's what I'm talking about. Mm, yeah. Uh. I came from the mud. Oh, yeah. There's dirt on my hands. It makes me feel like I'm in the UFC. Strong like a tree. And that pre walk, you know? There's roots where I stand. Oh, I've been running. Every time I hear songs that inspire me, I, I think about walking into an arena to kick somebody's ass. Just. Mouthpiece on. Undefeated at 14 and 0, 14 KOs. People going, this dude's incredible. I love that, man. I love that song. It gets me hyped. You know what I mean, doesn't it? It's a hype song. And the great thing about it, it's free. I can, you know, it's not copyrighted, so we can play that all day and we don't have to pay for it. So I like it even better. Free, that's one of my three favorite F's. Free fucking food. Because you can interchange them. Free fuck food. Fucking free food. Free fucking food. I mean, you can always you can interchange all three of them. That's why I like it. Seriously, that's my three favorite Fs in the whole world. Free fucking food. Because you can... No, fucking free food. Dude, free food? Fuck. Man, that's my favorite one. So I like that song. Gets me hyped. And I'm so hyped for this show right now because... I Actually, I get hyped for every one of my shows. And, uh, like, to me, no guest is better than the other because that'd be disrespecting the other guest. Everybody has a different story, and that's why I love what I'm doing here, man. And I want to welcome, we got a new, um, here's how great Wyatt is doing, my producer, director. Here's how great, he hired an assistant. Name is Malik. Malik, how you doing, bro? Malik, come here just for a second. Just come here for a second. I want you to say hi to the people. Don't, don't, just say hi and leave, okay? Look, it, doesn't he look like the kind of guy, he's either working security or he does the lights at a concert, one of those kind of guys? Like, can I talk to the, uh, no, you can't talk to Drake right now. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, you know what I mean? How about if I show you? My, how about if I show you my breast? All right, you can go talk to Drake. <laughs> That's what Malik looks like. But I'm glad to have Malik here, man. Seriously, I hope you're here with us for a while, man. I honestly, I mean it from the bottom of my heart. I love what I do. Why? Why it's the man? He gets it all together. I just come in and do my talking. As you can tell, the only thing I can do is talk. So I'm glad you're here, Malik. Malik, what'd you do before this? What'd you do before? You were in school, like high school or college? Indiana State, okay, in Terre Haute, what was your major? English, oh, so you can read and write too. I hope so, okay, good. So what do you want to do, write books or what do you want to do? Writer for a TV show and a movie. Me and Malik going to be talking after this show. I got ideas. You're going to write them down, and I'm going to decide. I'm, I'm going to give you my, what's in the dome, and you're going to write them down. We're going to be award-winning script writer, screenplay, you understand? I know you're laughing now. you thinking, whatever, bro, but I got ideas. You're going to flush them out. You're going to write them down. You do the, the legwork. I'll do the, the up here, and we're going to be a team, okay, because a team is one, Malik. A team is one. All right, folks. Man, for this show, you know me. I always have great guests, and in a minute, why don't you hit him up with the link now? My guest for today, I, I got, he's got the link? Well, you want to hit him up and say, uh, punch it in now? Okay. Now, I, now I, why do I, do I have to do the work? I, well, okay, but, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I gas Wyatt up, and now he's making me look bad in front of my chicks. So I'm going to hit him up on the link, uh, my guest here. I'm, I'm, I ain't going to say it. I want to be a surprise to you people. Uh, just click the link, and let's have some fun. And let's, let's have some fun. Some fun. All right. All right. This is going to be great. I'm so excited for this. I, I always try to do my homework, but for this guy, there's not really that much uh, to be seen. Like last week, uh, and I had Kenny Monday on the show last week. Kenny Monday, the Olympic wrestler. And it was kind of easy because I kind of grew up an hour away from him. So I knew kind of a little bit of his backstory. And, you know, there's always, uh, there was videos, about three hours of videos that I went through. So I knew a lot about him. But my next guest, man, there's really. Uh, He's he's a half of the MotoGP commentating team, and so there's not really much on him. So it was kind of uh, funny that um, that so I had to do a lot of digging, and and then I said, well, I'm gonna have to wing a lot of it, you know, ask him like questions. Well, I think it's gonna be fun. So wait for him to click the link. It's gonna be uh, one half of the MotoGP commentating team. Hopefully, we will be clicking that link anytime soon. Hopefully, 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 hopefully. All right, is that him? Is that him? I hope so. Oh, there he is. What's up, Steve? Can you hear me? Okay, okay. Hang on a sec. I can't hear a thing. I, I can Got hear it. you. Can you hear me? Hear you, and I can see you. Oh, can you can see me? I can see you. 
Oh my God, ladies and gentlemen, this is why I love this show because now I'm interviewing all the people that I've wanted to, and this guy here is living the dream. He's the father of Charlie, the honey bunny of Lenny, and he's living the dream, living the life I would love to live. Half of the commentating team for Moto GP, Moto GP, please welcome Mr. Steve Day. How you doing, Steve? I'm good. How are you, man? Good. And you're moving. You're moving to a new house. Yeah, li uh, literally, if you could see the wreck that is next to me over here, you don't want to see it. There's boxes everywhere, and we're moving tomorrow, so uh, it's been quite busy. Well, how great is your life in a pandemic, everybody's on quarantine and lockdown. I'm about to buy me a tent and move in the woods because it's cheaper, and you're moving into a new house. You li how you do that, Steve? Seriously, do you have money stashed away? Well, no, how do you, no. <laughs> how'd you do no, that? We we got lucky. My financial advisor said to me that there uh, there might be an opportunity to find a house for good money. So there Stop we are. Stop it right there. Stop it right there. Fi you, your financial advisor. Really? My financial advisor is my dad. He goes, hey, boy, you got any money saved up? That's my, my financial advisor. <laughs> and, and you have to call your financial advisor. Go, it's a good time to get a house. Really? Why don't you just rub it in, Steve, that your, li that your life is even better than mine, please? You haven't seen the house yet. It's just a shed. Yeah. <laughs> 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 whatever you know what the great thing about you is honestly you honestly like you know people on the outside looking in nothing is is what people think it is but you look at people's social media and it's not but for you i can honestly say you are living the dream because look at your social media and you're always smiling always having a good time you got a, gr a beautiful son took him to the beach the other day i saw on in instant media on uh, social media and your wife you can tell you love your wife and and the fact that i know you're living the dream is i've seen you at after parties after the race in austin and you were a couple cups in and i was like he is definitely enjoying it <laughs> you really are you have the greatest smile and i could tell by your eyes i was like man this guy is having a great night it was when uh james tozen was playing uh on the piano and i walked in i go steve day and i don't even know if you remember that night because we took a picture together and i was like do you remember i do remember the night yeah very very well yeah um, austin is one of our it's one of the highlights of the season for us because the, that piano bar is just great. And, and you don't get that anywhere else across the world when we travel. And um, we really let our hair down on Sunday night in Austin. It's the, we're, we're so disappointed at the moment that we can't go there. Um, yeah. I know things are tough in the States at the moment with, with COVID-19, but I can't wait to go back. It's one of the highlights of my year going there. Well, I mean, let's talk about that. Usually, I, I've always kind of skipped over it when I talk to people, but has a, has a little bit of a depression hit with you because of this virus? I mean, I, I know because, you know, they had, they had to stop it. I was all, I was getting ready to go to Qatar. I was going to be there. I was going to go for the opening race. I, you know, I did it uh, about, uh, the, I forget, about three or four years ago, and I, I was looking forward to going again. I just finished up a gig uh, in Texas, and I go, man, I can't wait. I'm going to Qatar. And I think that Sunday or Monday, it said the premier, the premier, the premier class was canceled. And after that, man, a sense of depression just hit because after that, then we went to quarantine. So has that affected you a little bit? Oh God, yeah. I mean, I, I've been. I mean, the, the, don't don't be fooled by the smiles on my social media. <laughs> it, there have been some dark days because it's the longest I've gone without working. Um, it's it, it's been an uncertain time for so so many people. Um, and you know, at the start, it was scary. Quite honestly, I mean, right. you know, you worry family. I've got like my parents are, were both, uh, you know, in the category where they could be considered vulnerable. And, so it was scary and depressing at the same time, not knowing how long we were going to be doing it for. And But I think it, it's amazing how the, the human mind, the human body gets used to things because as time's gone on, it's, although I'm really excited to go back into MotoGP, which we'll obviously talk about soon, um, I've become used to it so quickly and it's become my new normal. And I've now started to appreciate that. I mean, in the first, first month or so, yes. oh my God, I'm Really yes. struggling. Really struggling. I'm so glad you said that. I mean, I felt the same way. I was like, it was just, I don't know how the weather was. over. I know English weather shit, but, I, but over here, you know, it was, it was dark and it was, it was like, it was just, you know, combined with the weather. It was dark. It was kind of cold. We expected to warm up and I didn't have GP and I was like, oh man. And it was just hard to get up. I mean, the great thing about, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, the great thing was 
Luckily, Moto 3 and Moto 2 were in Qatar. And honestly, it sounds, and it so sounds like I'm just kind kissing up whatever, but that got me through a lot because I could replay the race and play it over and over again. And that was a good part. But after that was over, it's like, okay, here we go. And so, man, I want to thank you guys, you and Matt, for just get me, getting us through that. And now, like, we're about to start up again. So it's like you see a sense of, like, uh, like the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, it's like that for everyone. Me and Matt have spoken and, and a load of other people about getting back to work. I mean, it's, there's a lot of protocols, obviously, to, to stick by. And, and it, uh, to the people at home, it, it might not look any different, which is really good. Um, because, you know, you're going to be seeing the best in the world racing, and that's great. And we can't wait to stay on it. Um, but for us, it, it's going to be outside the commentary box, a different world, certainly, for the rest of this year. Um, you know, with the, 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 the protocols and contingencies that are in place for us uh, are insane. And obviously, we've got to try and keep everyone safe. And, and But, hey, we're really excited to get back to, to work. And I even had to watch back a bit of the Qatar race the other day just because I forgot what happened. So. Yes. <laughs> yes. I was going to ask you if you did. I was, was going to ask you, do you remember, even remember the podiums, for, uh, 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 Moto2 and Moto3? I mean, honestly, cause I didn't realize until I watched it, and, man, I had a lump in my throat, but when, when uh, uh, Tetsuma uh, uh, got that podium, uh, was it, uh, yeah, yeah, when he got the podium in Moto2, because he was friends with, uh, um, uh, the, uh, oh, and why is it leaving me? He was friends with the guy who passed away, and they were best friends, and it was 10 years. It, that hit me so hard watching that man. It was so much Nagashima, Nagashima. Yeah, that's uh, and, yeah, and and uh, that was an emotional moment. I remember him winning the race, and I remember the emotions, and I remember Albert Arenas winning the Moto Three race. But other than that, my mind was just like, "What happened in Qatar?" So. Uh, <laughs> Well, being American, I remember Joe Roberts getting pole, and I just remember I felt so good for him because he was in such a down mood at the end of Valencia, and I talked to him, not that I'm the magic, you know, the magic man or whatever, or the magic black man that you talk to, and all of a sudden, your life gets better, like in all the movies, like I'm the, like I'm the MotoGP version of Bagger Vance, but I talked to him, but I talked. I talked to Joe Roberts in Valencia, and I go, man, blah, blah, see, you should really, you know, read The Secret. If you're not religious or whatever, read The Secret. It's kind of like the Bible, but without, you know, without the, without the God and stuff in it. Just read The Secret. It's positive. He go, what's that? I told him that, that, and I go, and I go, man, you'll be better. You know, I just kind of give him a pep talk, and I'll be damned. Like I said, not, I'm not, I'm taking credit for it, but after that, I think he had I think he had one of the best times he did in Blinthy and I was like, maybe it was me. And then it rolled over to, you know, he went to guitar, set the track record. And I go, you know what? I'm gonna take credit for that. I know John Hopper, you know, whatever. But I really think it was me talking to him that got him on the right track. So Moto 2, for me, was watching uh was watching Roberts get that fourth place, and I was so happy for him because man, it's gonna just make his confidence go high, up higher. So I was happy about that. But yeah, I had to go, I had to watch it too and realize what happened. Happen. It's almost like it's two different seasons coming up. Yeah, completely. I mean, it, it's going to be a completely different scenario. And, it, 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 you know, the, the thing is, we've just got no idea what, what's going to happen and how people approach it mentally as well. Because the thing is, with motorbike racing, so much of it is in the mind. Yes. And they're going to have to do all this in a, in a completely different way to what they do normally, as, uh, you know, in, in a general season. So speaking of that, we're going to take a step back in a way is that trying to research you, which is difficult because this, I mean, there's, there's no you out there. I don't know what you did in your former life. I don't know if you were like a secret agent and you erased all the tapes. There's nothing, <laughs> you, there's no Wikipedia, there's nothing. But I did find out what was great and surprising is you used to race, which gives you a great perspective. You used to race. And I want to talk to you about that. Tell us like, what did you race? What cat did you ever win a race? What, what category? Tell us about that, man. I want to hear about your race days yeah so i actually uh, got into bike racing through my dad because he was uh he was running a used car site and his the one of his salesmen raced bikes against the likes of fogarty and stuff like that and so they got into uh racing again and then i got hooked i was about 15 at the time and yes. uh, i thing at like club level grass and roots level in the uk and then did some british championship stuff um but it was it was really cool. I did that for five six years, um, but I was racing against some of the elite guys that everyone knows today. At the time, you don't realize it. You're just yes. lining up on the, with with people like Cal Crutchlow, with Casey Stoner, and you just think, okay, well, I've got to beat these guys. Um, <laughs> even, even 
day I got my ass kicked. Um, <laughs> came back to, with the bike to my dad. I was like, hey, there's something wrong with the bike. I can't get these guys. Uh, but, uh, um, a lot of hurting myself, trying to get yeah. fast um, and a lot of money spent. I quickly realized I was never going to make it to the elite level. Um, and so, yeah, I went back to selling cars for a little while until I got into the media thing. So it's a, it's a weird way, but yeah, to, the, the fact that I did race, um, not at a world level or anything like that, does give me an understanding of how the sport works. I see some crashes and I know how the guys feel. Um, and I, I definitely think that that gave me a great grounding ahead of going into commentary. Okay, well, okay, so you're coming up, like I said, you don't know who's going to be, you know, you can't look in the future five years ago, wow, raced against that guy, but coming up when you were racing, who was the one guy that you went, holy shit, how can I, I can, I can never beat that guy, who was the, who was the man growing up when you were racing in that level with all those guys, who, because you raced against Chaz Davis, Casey Stoner, Cal, who was the one that made you go, who is that guy? Stoner. Stoner. Hands down. Really? Hands down. And we were, what, what did he have we were, that made you go, holy shit? Well, we were at Cadwell Park uh, in, a, in a championship called the Aprilia Super Teams. Now, that was a class for, for kids between the age of 12 and, and 15. And it was like the, the grassroots level for any kids coming up. And, and I remember being in a race in, at Cadwell Park in, in Lincolnshire in England. And I was battling away. There's like 30-odd kids on the grid. And we were battling away like, hell, me and these, these other guys for about 14th, 15th place. And we were going through one of the fastest parts of the circuit. And we thought we were so quick through there. <laughs> so just me, me. And that was Stoner coming to Lappers on lap five of the race. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. That had to be mentally defeating. <laughs> I was like, there is a guy who came past me twice today with the number 66 on his bike. And I don't understand what the hell happened. And then, so we knew even as kids, that he was, he was something completely different. Uh, he was so, so fast. Um, uh, yeah, that was demoralizing, really demoralizing. <laughs> Hell of a lot better. <laughs> I, I don't mean to laugh, but, man, I mean, looking back on it now, I don't mean to laugh at you because you, you did have the balls to do it. But, man, that, to me, that's hilarious. You're really thinking you were doing something. You and these guys, I can beat these guys in <laughs> And somebody passes, laughs you twice. You go, who the hell is that guy? <laughs> really, it was not work. I mean, there was, it, he's the main one that I raced against that I could honestly say just look to cut above the rest, just to yeah. put in a different way. I mean, people like Cal and, and Chaz and that, they were so fast. And Cal whooped my ass so many times. Um, but uh, Casey was just a, a different league. Um, I only raced against him seven or eight times, but um, oh god, it was it was horrendous. <laughs> and I don't mean to laugh at you, Steve. I really don't. But I just think because you're saying that like it just happened yesterday, and it was just horrendous. I don't I don't know what I don't know what happened. I just want to get, I just want to get my kid and go home. Charlie, you ready to go? <laughs> That's what it seems like. The story I'm happy to relate to you, BT, but I am never. Tell that story to my child. <laughs> <laughs> All the tapes will be burned. They will never hear about it. Never happened. It never happened. No, no I'll, say, I'll say to my wife, Lindy, I'll just say, hey, look, just tell him I won a few races. And just... <laughs> <laughs> now, did you win a couple races? Did you win a couple races? Did you ever win? No, I didn't even do that. So I could, that would be a complete lie anyway. Um, <laughs> I, we went back to club level and we did a few and we won a few trophies and things like that. But that was the one thing that was missing was was winning a, a, a trophy. But I spent too long at a level I probably shouldn't have been at, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, it may have been a different story, but um, hey, those days uh, are long gone now. So uh, I'm, I'm more than happy. I still miss it every now and again. You know, if it's a sunny day and uh, I, I sometimes want to get out on the bike, but more often than not, I'm more than happy just to talk about it and it hurts a hell of a lot less. Well, that, that, that's what I want to talk about. It's like, I mean, you could say that and everything, but I'm not, I'll am i be the first one to tell you, and I don't know if you guys ever see me from the commentary booth on the grid, but 
look at, I mean, when I'm at those, you know, walking around and before the race, you know, with the dog and pony show, as Nikki used to say, you know, and they got the umbrella girls. And I see those guys, honestly, inside, I just go, oh, this could have been me if I would have did this and that. And, and I know you can say it doesn't hurt, but man, in the back of your mind, or at least in the back of my mind, when I, when I watch, you know, I used to wrestle before. So when I watch Olympic wrestling or when I watch racing, and I go, oh, if I, w- I would have focused more, if I would have did this. And you say it doesn't bother you, but does it kind of sting a little bit? I mean, you live a great life. Like I said, you, you do, you're living the dream, doing your job. You got a beautiful family, everything, but a little bit. Like you said, on a sunny day, and everything's perfect. Maybe maybe Charlie's asleep. Maybe your wife is doing something in the garden. Or whatever. I don't know if you have a garden or not. But does it make you go, oh, if I would have just did this a little bit more, if I would have did, you know, I mean, I don't know. Does it? I mean, does it really eat at you a little bit? I mean, you say that, but. I mean, I, I suppose there, there, there's the odd occasion where I feel like I could have done better, but I don't think I would have ever. I'm under no illusions as to the fact that I would never have made it at world championship level. Um, I think ultimately there comes a point where you can win some club races and you might even win a few British championship races, but there comes a point where you've got to go beyond this to this level where those guys are just insane. Um, and I was never willing to, to push it to that level. So I don't sit here with tremendous regrets. I, I mean, I wish I'd have raced in a slightly different way. I'd have done things a little bit differently, but, um, I'm not too sure a lot would have changed, to be honest with you. Okay, fair enough. Fair, and here's how I say me and you are alike in that when I spent my vacation last year, when I spent my vacation, right, uh, I went to England for the first time for a vacation. And the first track I went, I landed on a Sunday, Sunday morning, and I drove my ass to Cadwell Park was the first track I went to. Went to Cadwell on Sunday, and then I went to uh, Alton Park on Tuesday, and then I did a track day at Donington Park on Wednesday, and I was at Silverstone annoying all the English people from Thursday through Sunday. <laughs> oh, cool. that's the way to do it i mean cattle park is an awesome uh an awesome circuit it was one of my favorites to ride i mean you, you'll never get motor gp there but uh it was it it's a great thing to, to come and do and, and british racing is 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 certainly a completely different level to any other i think in terms of a national motorcycle sport um the the, the circuits are, are unique um and it's i think even so they're so narrow. That's what it surprised me. They're, I mean, that was the one that surprised me. Like, holy shit, how can you get a track so narrow with so little runoff? No, I know. It is, it is crazy. I mean, it, it's obviously, it wouldn't be allowed. You'd never be allowed to race motor GP. There wouldn't be safe enough uh, for, for reasons like that. But it is cool at the same time, you know, and that's why people love uh, British Superbikes. Um, and, and, and it's just, uh, it's a, it, there's some really great circuits here, but it's unfortunate for me that um, we can't race MotoGP at, uh, at Donington or Brands Hatch in a way because they've got character to them. Um, Silverstone is, is amazing. I mean, it's, it's, so, it's so fast and the circuit yes. layout is just incredible. I just wish that maybe there was a way where it had a little bit more atmosphere, you know, because it's so, it's so vast. Um, it just maybe doesn't quite have the character in terms of the surroundings that some other British circuits have. But I mean, in terms of the speed and, and what it does for MotoGP, I mean, it is fantastic. I think that was one of the best vacations. I've been to like almost all the, almost all the circuits, but man, I, I agree with you. I love Silverstone. I, I heard, you know, the, uh, the, the, the yays and the nays about it, you know, that it was, you know, too big and this and that, but well, I walked it and it was just, and it, that was a hell of a walk, by the way, that's a huge circuit, but man, it was so beautiful. I found a nice little place where on, on the back straight and watched them before they hit the turns and it was so, and nobody was there really. I mean, there's a couple of photographers there and I just loved it. I mean, I, I enjoyed Enjoyed that vacation immensely, but that but finishing up at Silverstone was just incredible. I loved the circuit, loved it. Everything around I thought was beautiful. And so here's what we, now we're gonna fast forward. You're out of racing. You're selling used cars. By the way, when we get off here, I did a movie called Suckers, where the only movie I've done, and I was a used car salesman. My name is JJ. I want you to YouTube it. Don't don't laugh at me. It was, it was a serious movie. Don't laugh. I have a sex scene and everything. Okay. Um, you gotta watch it. You go, wow, he was a thespian. I did a movie called Suckers. It was about a used car salesman. I want you and your dad to watch that movie, and I'm BT as. JJ, and I want you to watch it, and I want you to go, wow, he really did that. So that's what I did. I want you to watch it. It's called Suckers. 
Call sucker. I know you're writing it down. That's what you do. You're a professional. Oh, I'm writing it down. <laughs> Oh my, oh my God! YouTube, <laughs> YouTube is going. Yeah, I'm in it, so I want you to watch the movie once this is over. So you're selling used cars, and and from what I heard, uh, you uh, you at your uh, your dad had a race team, and so they they needed somebody to announce for free, basically, and they gave the mic to you, and the rest is what they say is history. How'd that come about? Yeah, um, I was selling some cars and stuff like that. And, and my dad ran, started to run a grassroots series and just said, hey, at the weekends, come along and um, just mess around on the microphone. Um, I used to sing karaoke a lot at my <laughs> mum and dad. Today, so he knew that I wasn't shy with a microphone. So um, I just said, yeah, hey, why not? Uh, and then I did it. And then one day, the, the live circuit announcer was ill. And they said, like, we, we need a commentator. Um, and I just said, I'll give it a go. And that was the first time I'd ever commentated in my life, uh, with no notes. And we just did it. Um, and a couple of people went, hey, do you know what? That wasn't so bad. So <laughs> you, you, why don't we have another go? And it just kind of escalated from there. And the, the, the show started to be televised and I started commentating for them. And then I, uh, I hounded um, Eurosport here in the UK to try and get me some work. And eventually they, they they buckled and said, God, we're going to have to give this car. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so they gave me a, a little bit of work and then they said, okay, this isn't so bad. And, um, and, and then I started to cover the odd bike race and it just kind of just built and built and built. And, and, you know, I ended up doing some MotoGP races for Eurosport, some World Superbike. And then, and then I got in, um, Dawna got in touch with me and said, you know, do you want to come over and, and work for us so it's just gone from there really that's great and it's nepotism at its finest and there's nothing wrong with that i mean seriously there's nothing wrong with nepotism if i had a kid i would do the same thing i mean i, I think that's great but you're like me your philosophy is like me is that you if you annoy somebody enough and they go okay we'll give you a shot and and you're ready when that shot happens there's nothing wrong with that if you just kind of needle them hey how about this how about this hey, the squeaky wheel always gets the grease and you got the grease. That's what a, a booker told me. She goes, listen, BT, call me every week. I know you'll annoy me. That's what I do. I annoy people. I know you'll annoy me, but eventually you'll get work, and that's what I did. I mean, here's, and here's how annoying I am. I'm, I'm going to skip here. Is that whenever I go to GP, I, I'm like a kid in a candy store. So I was out before the GP guys go out. I was out when they, when they, when they, out and they give them the rip flag and they can go into the circuit. And I'm, close, and I'm closer to Bradley Smith than anybody. So Bradley Smith is getting ready to get on the track. He comes. And he's and he turns and he sees me and he shakes his head in his helmet and then he just rides rides off and I thought that was a guy he like oh god he's here again and then he went onto the circuit <laughs> and that's, and that's just me I feel so I feel like I should I feel like I should write a handwritten letter to every rider in MotoGP and say I'm sorry because I'm just the I'm a grown man. And if you see me in the paddock, I'm just like, oh my God, there's so and so. And I'm I'm a little bit better now, but that's what I do. And you am but you got a job out of it, which I think is great. And tell me, how did it feel when you first put on the mo and when you got the you got the call, you're gonna work for Moto GP. How did it feel when you put on the shirt that said Moto GP and you knew you were about to step into a new dimension? That was such a great, great moment for me because I'd seen the the uniform before and I couldn't wait to get my hands on it. I couldn't wait to wear it. Uh, I was so proud to get it. Um, and it was, a, it was a fantastic feeling to know that, I, because I, I, I dreamt, dreamt as a kid that if I didn't make it as racing, that I wanted to do something TV-wise, but I never thought it would actually happen. And so to, to actually have the MotoGP shirt on um, was, was a great feeling. And it, and it still is, you know, every now and again, you go upstairs and you get, you know, to do something in the, in the bedroom and then you see your, your GP case there and you just have to kind of pinch yourself to remind yourself that, you know, that's what you do. Um, so it is, it was an amazing feeling. It really was. And to be honest with you, when I first joined, I actually had no idea the impact the world feed had. I mean, I, I just thought that a few people tuned in. I, did, I had no idea that um, there were so many people that watched it. Um, and so it is, to me, still even odd now. If anybody comes up to us and talks to us about our commentary, it is really odd. <laughs> Isn't it? You don't like I, every guest I've interviewed, and it's weird. You live your life and you don't really think about it, but you do. You do have an impact. I mean, it's like honestly, it's like 
I'm talking to you now, but to me, you were un unattainable. When you first came onto the scene, you know, when Nick, Nick left and then you came, I was like, who's this new guy? And it's like, and in, and in the beginning, I think it's like that with everybody because you're accustomed to Nick and whatever. And so when you stepped in, I was like, who's this new guy? I was like, okay, okay. And then, and now I watched the races and I was playing it for my producer. I go, this is the guy I'm interviewing today. And man, the, the excitement you bring to the booth, you can't fake that. The passion, you can't fake that. I mean, like we watched your Qatar feed. I mean, it's always, you know, Dovey, Dovey and Mark, but also in, in, the, in the, the smaller class, when Moto3 classes. I mean, that, and I, and I always say this, Moto3 to me, it's almost my favorite in a way because those are the guys they're still chasing that dream and they and and they're at that level it's like it's like minor league baseball they're in double a and they're trying to get to the majors and that's why I love and I always have uh, my philosophy is if you befriend a moto 3 rider if they make it to the GP they'll always like talk to you or they'll always remember you like hey that guy remember me when nobody knew me and that's the way I feel about it. that's why I that and that's why Bradley Smith and is close uh and I mark Marquez I mean honestly when mark Marquez Marquez, the picture of me and Mark Marquez in Magello when he was a Moto 2, and I'm hugging him like this in, in, in his garage, and he's got a look on his face like, who is this guy? And I think from there, we've always, <laughs> and from there, I think he's always kind of like, when I see him, he has it look like, ah, I mean, he's like, you know, he's all big time now, but it's like, ah, and that's what I believe. And so I just think your impact on me and everybody else, yeah, you can't understate that, man, and what you do. I know it feels like, yeah, a couple yeah, people know me, but no. What you do is incredible, and we feel it's infectious. How you announce that it's infectious, and I feel that passion. I know you. I tell people all the time. Usually, I'm at a hotel room, and it's three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, and I'm trying to watch this stuff. And your voice is, it lifts us, man. It makes it, it. I could feel that passion that you have. I feel it too. So it's cool to have somebody that feels the same way like I do. Except for you get paid, and I don't. And that's why. <laughs> and I think that is great, man. So you know what? We're talk, talking about your life. Let's get to GP. Let's talk about GP a little bit. I, I I like delving into your life, which I think is great, but, you know, you got to give, I guess, to the people or whatever. So let's go start talking about MotoGP. Now, for this season coming up, do you think there's going to be an asterisk once this is over uh, to, uh, uh, to the season? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I, I, I hope not. Um, it's so difficult to say whether, you know, if Mark was to win or somebody else was to win their first championship, whether someone would say, yeah, but you won in the, the season where there was only so-and-so races. But, you know, personally, I think not, because when you really look uh, back at the, the world championships, they used to be world championships that were even less than what we're going to get 12, 13 rounds. Right. Um, and there's no asterisk next to their name. And so this is the world championship. It's the same for everyone. Um, you know, had it have been maybe just five or six races? Yeah, I'd say possibly you're in danger of, of that being a championship that people might just wash away and say it doesn't count. But for me, I think if you win a, a world championship like this, 13 races in what is it, 17, 18 weekends, you yeah. fully deserve it. It's going to be insane. I mean, once it starts, it's going to be insane. But I think the guys are going to be in shape, but I just think it's going to be it's going to be crazy. I mean, I'm looking forward to it. Like I said, it's going to, it's going to bring something to my life now. It's going to, you know, something to look forward to. Other than these Wednesdays when I do this interview, uh, interviews like this on my podcast, it's going to give me like, oh, finally it's here. We got F1 this weekend, which is great. And it's going to, a little bit in the heart. But man, my passion for GP grows so strong. That's why I'm going to ask you, do you feel the same way about Moto3 that I do? That you look at those guys as the future? And do you, and do you enjoy watching Moto3? Yeah, completely. I mean, I've, I've grown up um, from, from grassroots level in the UK where I can see young British kids making their way through from the age of 12 and some of them have made their way up now and that's really, really cool. So people like Jake Dixon, who's now in Moto2, yes. I when he was like 11. So um, it, that's a really, really nice thing. And, and the races, I mean, how can you not love the races? They're oh. just absolutely insane. I mean, we can, me and Matt, we cannot maintain too much excitement throughout an entire race because every lap is ridiculous. I mean, we have to save ourselves a little bit, um, but fantastic. And, and the same for, for the riders, you know, you know that if you can get along well with them in the beginning, it, it bodes well for the future. And um, I think that's the kind of situation everyone's getting a little bit with Quattararo at the moment because most, most people knew him when he first started out and now, right. you know, uh, he is where he is and, and genuinely, well, hopefully going to be challenging for a world championship. Well, if you look at Moto3 now, okay, right now, 
I'm gonna step ahead. Immortal three now. Top of your head, top of your head. Like who are the favorites now? Who who uh, who are you? Th- Give me three top favorites for you for winning the championship right now. The three favorites you think right now. Jeez. See how rusty you are right now. <laughs> See how rusty you are. I am rusty. I mean, I really like the look of uh, Sergio Garcia. Um, yes. I think he's got a tremendous potential. I think, uh, to be honest with you, honestly speaking, when you look through, if you discount too many, you're, you're in trouble because they'll come back and, 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 and haunt you. Um, there's 20 guys on that grid that can win races. Um, Everybody. Yeah, I mean, they're all, they've all got such tremendous potential. Dennis uh, Foggia is really, really quick and yet quite underestimated at the moment. Um, Jan Massia, obviously, there's a lot of expectation on his shoulders. It is really, really tough to call. I mean, and also what happens every year is there's always somebody who comes out to surprise you. Yes, it comes out of nowhere. Yeah, and you just think, where the hell did he come from? And... (laughs) Uh, they're lighting it up because the thing is, all it takes is just one moment for a rider's head to click into place where they're like, I can do this. I can do this week in, week out. And and then they do. And then next thing, they're, you know, a, a future world champion. So, I mean, Moto3 is a really, really hard one to call. There's so many riders out there that I respect and I think they've got a great future. I look at Celestino Viete as, for some reason, I watch this guy in his first race, and he lays back in the gut. To me, he's like a snake, man. He's like, he's like an anaconda. He'll just lay back. And you go, is this guy going to do anything? He'll be in 12th by the third lap. And, I mean, three laps from the finish. And, and, it's, and, and, uh, and then two laps, the, 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 you know, the, 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 uh, the second lap, the, and then the, the penultimate lap. And then that last lap, he'll just, and he'll get a podium. That guy, and it, Celestino Biete, to me, is the future. I, I've liked this kid from the moment, the first moment he came on, and he replaced uh, Bulaga. He replaced Bulaga, and I said, who is this kid? And he had to think I was crazy because, again, here's how I know him. It was in Austin, and, they, you know, they got to come through this uh, like the little, the little walkway in Austin. He was a, for some reason he was the last one to come through. The, and I was like Celestino. And even in his helmet, he was like, "Who is this guy? Nobody knows me." And he went through. But I think he is the future. And also Raul Fernandez. I don't know. It's something about Raul Fernandez. I think watch out for that guy. And Philip Salak. Philip Salak. I. I think he'll be at a podium, and I think he'll actually win a race this year. Moto, like you said, it's wide open, and I say, and I was, t- I say all, all the time about Moto three. It's a bar fight. You don't know who's gonna win. It's like that door shuts, and everybody's swinging, and then when the police come, they turn the lights on. Who's winning? And the last person holding that beer mug in their hand after smashing on somebody's head, that's the winner. And it's, <laughs> and that's what it's, it's, it's a bar fight every week. That's what Moto three yeah. is, and that's why okay. I love it, man. Okay, so no, Moto. Go ahead, go ahead. I agree. Sorry. It's okay, okay. What about Moto Two now? Moto Two. We talk about Moto Three. Moto Two is a murderer's row. You got. I mean, you've got. To me, I, I love what Jorge Martin does, but at the same time, and I. It, to me, he's. Uh, I, I call him Iannone Light, and that's uh, Baldassari. Baldassari on his good day, when everything's working right and his brain is clicking right. He's the most talented rider in Moto2, and this is my personal opinion. When Baldessari is on, when he is on, he's hard to beat. Like I say, he's got that raw talent like Iannone, but no, no, no. he's a little more he's a little more calmer, I think. But at the same time, he'll do something you go, where did that come from? And I love Baldessari. I love what Baldessari does. Moto2 is a murderer's row this year. It really is, yeah. I mean, Baldessari is just a... For some reason, he starts the season always really, really strong. He comes out of the blocks so fast. And like you say, when he's on it, he's, he looks really unbeatable. Um, but for some reason, something happens to him uh, four or five rounds in where his head just falls off and, and <laughs> results go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, hopefully for him, that doesn't happen. But it's really, really unusual. I mean, it is so strange. Um, I think Jorge Martin, if he can get rid of injury problems, is... A major star. I think he's he's the not phenomenal. He really, really is. But that class, like you say, that is a class that does not reward you for maybe putting in your 100 percent effort. Sometimes you could be so close and yet 20th place. You know, you can be four tenths of a second off in qualifying and be 20th on the grid and not have a chance of winning the race. So it's a really, really tough class. But I think that's been getting stronger every year for sure. 
I love Moto2. I like what Luca Marini has done to me. Now, he is another guy, to me, he came out of nowhere. And he came to Moto2, and he started kicking ass. I like what he does. I like what Remy does also. I think Remy's another guy. If he needs consistency, but when he gets it, Remy's going to be up there. I like I, I just all those. And to me, and it started in the midpoint of last year in Moto3. But Aaron Kinnett, I don't know if he took yoga or he got in touch with meditation, but that guy, there, there's been no 18-year-old kid that has put the fear of God in me than seeing Aaron Kinnett at an after party. I see him, I'm going the other way. If I got to jump out of a third-story window to to keep from running into a, a drunk Aaron Kinnett, I will do it. He scares me. But the way he, I mean, things weren't good. He was trying to come up for the championship, and you saw he was doing the right things, but sometimes you just get caught up. And he, and I just remember being in Silverstone, and he got crashed by somebody. I want to say Arenas. I can't be sure. But I just remember he still kept a calm head the whole time. He never lashed out. It never was. You know, like I think in the beginning he was a hothead. And for some reason, I don't know if he got in touch with his inner, his inner, his inner chi, like, mm, but he became a different rider and a different person and became more calm. And so I think from the outside, I like what Aaron Kinnett is doing because I think his head is right. And, and toward the end of the season, who knows? But I like Aaron Kinnett. What do you think about Aaron Kinnett? Yeah, Aaron Kinnett is, is definitely a good shout. I mean, I, I'm, you're not alone in feeling scared by him. I mean, there's been more than a few occasions <laughs> that scared by Aaron as well. Um, definitely something changed in his mentality because he's always been known as a hothead until midway through last year. Maybe there's the calming influence of the team that's around him with Biaggi and, and uh, Philip Ertel's dad as well, who's like one of the calmest guys on the planet. Um, but... Hey, in Moto2, I mean, he did really, he, he was really strong throughout all the practices in Qatar in Moto2. There is going to be no one that wants to see a pit board that says plus zero, Aaron Kinnett. <laughs> there is going to be no one because he, he sees a gap and he is, so there is, he is a guy no one really race with. So if he can find his feet quickly, um, for sure, he's definitely got something, but he's a, He's an oddball. You know, he's really strange. You never really kind of know what you're going to get with Aaron when you meet him in the paddock, whether he's going to be really jokey, funny, serious, or, you know, whether you're just like, I'm just going to avoid him at all costs. So. <laughs> yes. I, honestly, I can look at Aaron Kinnett, and there's, and there's mafia hitmen going, I want to hire that guy this weekend. You know, <laughs> <laughs> if you're not racing this weekend, we got a job for you. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's the guy, guy Aaron Kinnett. And the thing about that is, he's always been so nice to me. We've gotten coffee together, and I'm not going to lie, my hand was doing this like, please don't bump into this guy. And I was, But he was so nice. I made him laugh, and he was great. But, yeah, he puts the fear of God in me. Now, moving yeah. on to Mo. You know, I mean, GP go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say about Aaron Kinnett, you mentioned uh, Mafia. I mean, I, I've been calling him Little De Niro for yeah, about no. three <laughs> <laughs> That was you. I was wondering, if that, was that me or was that you? Because you see his head and you go, oh, this guy's definitely boxed a couple of times. And you call him <laughs> Little De Niro. <laughs> Little Raging Bull is what you call him. Little <laughs> <Ra> <laughs> Oh my god. Okay, I'm glad it wasn't just me. I'm glad it wasn't just me. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's move on to Moto GP. I know people listening want us to get the GP, but I love all the classes. I like to give everybody the complete respect they deserve because it's the championships and the world championship riders. But Moto GP, what do you think the story you know that I forgot the story coming in is, and I forgot if you remember during the first part of the season before uh, the C word hit was that it was Mark's shoulder, and the Honda really was performing that well. So now we, we've had the break, but they still got to get a bike that's working to Mark's liking, and they're only going to get one test, and then they're going to go to the race. They're going to test, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, on Wednesday, and then they're going to start the race weekend on a Thursday. And that bike is not yeah. what he wanted it to or wanted it to be. Well, I mean, when we finished testing in Qatar before it, everything kicked off with – coronavirus i mean it was definitely a, the concern was mark shoulder is the honda going to work i mean i think they found something at the end of the final day that they seemed happier with but yeah for sure at that time that was all anyone was talking about and but so much has happened since then um it's really hard to know what to expect i mean i think with marquez <laughs> no, no matter what physical condition he's in he's gonna find a way he of, always of finds a way he would 
ride a wheelbarrow to, to second place. <laughs> yeah. so. It's the truth, though. I mean, the guy, he's, the, he's to me, the true definition of a winner because – I mean, and, and on and off the bike, because at the press conferences, he's always focused. He always says the right things. And he's and he's just like you said, you know, when things aren't going well, he fine. And when things are going well, he still comes in second. Last year was it's unbelievable. He still finds a way. And that's what makes him so compelling. Yeah. And, and I think I mean, it, last year was an astonishing year. His best year by a million miles. I mean, I hope for everyone else's sake and for our sakes as well, watching that it's a little bit more neutral because it was just a one-man show last year. And the problem is as well, when he gets in control of the championship, his, the way he manages it is just no one can even deal with that because he's yeah. just like, okay, I'll just follow you home and I'll take 20 points and I'm going to win the world championship. So he'll need to be put under pressure, I think, from round one from the you know it's a different championship mark doesn't know any other anything other than 100 percent. and if he leaves the two hereth races with two wins or leaves the championship it's going to be so hard to stop he needs someone to really give him some trouble in the first uh two races for, for this to go any other way in my opinion because he's that good now i Personally, and everybody's looking forward, and me too, don't get me wrong. Everybody's looking forward to what Quattro is going to do this year, his, his sophomore effort. And we were all, I thought, and I want to say he was the people's champ. He was the one that you, you couldn't help but root for the guy, man. You know, his freshman year, and he was going against the champ. You know, he, he was like that guy that, you know, not really like a, a, a non contender, but he was the guy going against the champ. He's trying to fight Tyson. He's the one, like, I like this guy. And a rep, and, you know, what happened to the bike, and you see the passion that he had, and everybody's rooting for him. But this year, I think it's going to be different because now there's going to be the pressure. He, last year, he didn't have the pressure. It was like, hey, just go have fun. Go do what you do. And everybody's like, oh, good for you, Fabio. But now it's going to be expected of him. Like now, hey, you got to get your first win. Now, you know, you, you rattled you rattled the, the, the tiger's cage. Now you got to get in there and tame that tiger. And so I'm going to be interested to see how he deals with the pressure. That's going to be the interesting part for me. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think if – if anyone, if you're looking at anyone at the moment as a as a direct contender to Mark, you'd look at Fabio. But I completely agree. I mean, it's like a it's like a, a pop artist, isn't it, or a singer? You know, it's the difficult second album syndrome. Um, he's got to come out, and, and there is going to be added pressure. Before before now, if he had an off weekend, he could just go, "Hey, I'm a rookie. Leave me alone." Um, but he's not going to have to fall back on anymore. And also, he's got the added pressure of knowing he's going to be factory rider the following two years. Um, so I don't know. There is something about him that is just so likable. Um, and I really hope that he delivers what he delivers at the yes. end of last year. Yes. Potential is just ridiculous. Um, and, and I really do think he could be a genuine contender to Mark, but he needs that. He's going to need that first win to come sooner yes. rather than for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, Matt is another one, you know, I mean, he could be up there as well. Um, consistency has always been the problem for him, but he seemed to find something at the end of last year as well. But whatever, whatever they do, those Yamaha guys, I mean, hopefully they've found a little bit more speed in the bike, but they have got to get the ball rolling from round one because if they get... There you go. Hey, what's hey? Sorry about that, buddy. I think it was yours, though. I think it was yours. Ours is good. I think it was your thing. That doesn't surprise me. I live in a, a sleepy town on the east of England, so... Uh, the Wi-Fi is probably disconnected. Now, where exactly? Because I'm going to come surprise you. So where exactly is, is the little sleepy town you live? It's a town called the most easterly point in the UK. And what, what's it called? Lowestoft. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll come to visit. I'll babysit Charlie. How about that? I'll babysit Charlie. Hey. And, and then you'll talk GP. And I know your wife will be like, thank God somebody does. And it'll just be me and you. And we'll go get some uh, uh, tea tea and uh, tea and crumpets. I think that's what you guys do. I think, right? Tea and biscuits. You guys are going to I'll do that. That's what I do, man. That's what I'll do. You, I know you shake your head. No, like, yeah, whatever, BT. Trust me. I have no life. I will do that. <laughs> All you got to do is say. Don't come here with tea and biscuits. Come with beers. <laughs> I will do that. I will do that. But man, before we, I, we only have five minutes to go anyway. But before you were talking about Fabio, and I and I agree with you on Fabio is that he's so likable, and that, that what what to me exemplifies that is during the rain delay last year in Austin, I'm in the uh, Alpine Stars uh, hospitality. 
he walks in and we're talking and then he goes, all right, I'm going to go play video games. And he leaves to go play video games. And I thought, man, that's a kid right there. How can you not love that? You know, I love the guy. I think he's great. But I'm going to say this. I have for the championship this year, I have Maverick Vinales. Vinales is yeah. happy. He's happy. He's got the career wants. And I think he's fixed the problems that people say. In the head. And here's what I think is the, the telltale sign is what happened in Phillip Island. When he and Mark went at it and he crashed. But if you listen to what his crew said, they go, it was, they basically said, what I read between the lines is he finally pushed himself, even though he crashed. And sometimes that's what it takes. He found the limit. Because, I mean, when Maverick got out in front, yeah, he was going to win or whatever. He came from behind, whatever. But the fact he du- he dueled with Mark and he w- and he lost, but and he crashed, in the end, but he pushed himself to that point. Now he knows what that limit is. And I, I got I got, I got Maverick Vinales winning the championship this year. That's what I have. Yeah, I don't think you, you, you're, you're far wrong. I mean, he's if, if um, you know, Simon Crayfar has always said to us, if, if Maverick can he- sort his head problems out, then he's one of the fastest riders in the world, hands down. Yeah, he's sensationally quick, and it looks like he is a lot happier. Like you say, the end of last year, he was really, really strong. And um, hey, I really hope so. I mean, it, he's going to have some head games to play with with Mark. That's the thing. And so, if he can sort the head out and everything's cool with that, definitely, he's got a, a massive, massive chance. Here's what I think is incredible. I mean, I think you've watched it, and I think a lot, and not a lot of people have, but. If you don't know the head games in MotoGP, watch Undaunted with Davicioso and you see what goes on behind the scenes. And the fact that it was Davicioso that did it, because, you know, he's kind of a guarded guy. He doesn't really like social media so much. And the fact that he did that and he showed what Marquez does to your soul. You know what I mean? I mean, three years. And the fact the way they celebrated in, in, um, in Spielberg when he beat him. And it was like he won the championship. I mean, when you when you beat the king, and that's what Marquez is, is the king. And I was in Silverstone when Renz beat him. They act like that's their championship right there when they win. That's But the effect, the Marquez effect he has on your soul as a man, as a competitor, he, imb- he, imb- he digs off in your soul and he makes you think all you think about is him. You just so much, don't so much think about the championship. Like, I got to beat Marquez. Where is Mark? And we talked about Kinnett, well, you see on the pit board. But when you're racing, you got a lead, and you see Marquez, point three. Oh, God. Marquez, point two. And, and, I, and there, there should be a pit board that says, he's here. That's, that's all he's just <laughs> They should have a pit board that says, he's here. <laughs> and that's all you need. It's like a horror movie. <laughs> you know? Well, it is, like, it is like a horror movie. And the thing is, what I've always said about Mark, and this is no disrespect to the man himself, because – you know he's he's a great character, but he is like it's like a baddie in a in a film winning every time. Yes, and and he eats away at everyone, and that's why they get so passionate when they beat him because he is the best in the world at the moment. But they also know, and they they've already seen that Mark really does not like losing. He hates losing, and so they I mean they're going to have to do a lot more of it to to get under his skin properly, but. There, will, there is, there is going to be a time at some point where Mark's not going to win anywhere near as much as he likes, and then it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with the head games in MotoGP. Yes, when he has to start managing races, when he has to go, yeah. I'm not fast. Okay, I get this podium, and I'll podium, podium, podium win it. Where instead of just outright just kicking your ass, that's going to be interesting. It is, but at the moment he's just so fast that he knows. He can just sit there and smile like the Joker and Batman, um, knowing that he's just got the ace card up his sleeve every time. Man. Yes. You know, and even when he sometimes finishes second, he's like, yeah, I didn't even push for the win because I'm like, I, I wasn't good today. He's, and, and then even that, he even makes the guys that have beaten feel bad for, for winning. And he's just got a really, really clever way. His whole, there is not a flaw in his game. That's the thing with him at the moment. You, I, I, I'm speechless because you said it. You nailed it, man. There's not a flaw. Now, saying that, who do you have for the championship winning this year? Who do you have winning the championship this year? Or, or can you? I know you, you You had to go through a lot of a lot of things to get to this interview. People don't realize you had to, uh, to jump through a lot of uh, hoops and fiery hoops or whatever and, and everything, and I appreciate that. So can you even say that? Can you even say that? And I don't want to get you in trouble with I the riders. Say who I, would, who I think would, would win. Um, and, and honestly... I can't see beyond Mark. I really can't at the moment. It's, it's hard for me to say that, and I know it might seem quite boring. 
Um, but I just can't see beyond him just because he finds the way. He always finds a way. And the others have got to prove that they can find a way to do it. I'd love to see somebody else win it or at least come really close. Um, but honestly, hand on heart at the moment, if I was really pushed, I'd have to go with, with Mark. I mean, if it's not Mark, I'd... Oh, I don't know. Come Between on. Vignal and Brown, probably. Okay, but, okay, uh, good. Okay, okay. Just, yeah, I mean, the great thing about this sport, if you know from watching it, is that, you know, we could have we could have anything happen in the first two rounds and completely change our minds. They could be right. somebody else. The opportunity knocks when you've got this meant 13 rounds, you can't afford to get injured at any point. You can't really afford too many DNFs. Um, so you've got to get this. You've got to judge it absolutely right. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry, man. I mean, at the moment, I just can't. <laughs> way past Marquez, so I know that's not the answer perhaps you were looking for. No, 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 man. I tell people, man, you talk, I mean, that's what you believe. That's what you believe in. It, it, there's nothing wrong with that. I just have, for some reason, I just have Vinales winning. That's me. I have Vinales winning in MotoGP, and my pick for Moto2, oh, I want it for Moto2. Moto2 so tough, but in the end, in the end, I'm going to have to say, mm, mm, I love Jorge Navarro. I love that kid. Uh, but 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 for Moto too, I, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Baldessari. I'm gonna say Baldessari wins it in all the Moto. I'm gonna say he gets his head together and wins it in Moto two and in Moto three. Even though, oh God, it's a murderous row. In Moto three, I say the experience of Albert uh, Albert Arenas because he's uh, he's got experience. I'm gonna say the experience of Albert Arenas. Who do you have Moto two champion? Who do you have? I think, I think you're far away there. I mean, I'm I'm. I'm really torn. I, I, oh. uh, I'm going to say... Uh, <laughs> Come on, it's not like me, let's make a deal. Come on. You. I'm going to go Jorge Martin for Moto2. Okay, okay. I think the things are going to sort themselves out for him. In Moto3, I'm going to go Tatsuki Suzuki. Oh, nice choice. I like that. I love that guy. I love what he brings to the table. And actually, you know, and here's a wild card out of nowhere, Agora. I like Agora got that podium in, in Qatar, and he's got a, correct me if I'm wrong, he has a sister that ra who raced Moto America last year. And she didn't get a podium, but that whole family really? is talented. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's his sister. They're related, I think. I think, I think. I like the social media. That's why. I like social media. And they don't do a lot on there. But, man, he, it, I'm pretty sure it's his sister. And she was a Moto America. And let me tell you something. She was an Anna. Vicious. I mean, vicious. We talk about, and, and rightfully so, we talk about Anna. We talk about Maria. It, it, great. But, man, that Oguro. Ooh. Ooh. She was tough. So, yeah, okay. So that, that's your prediction for there. I know we got to wrap it up, and I'm trying to get to everything, man. I tried to do all my notes because I was, I was coming against you, and you're one of the, you know, you are up here, and I'm down here. I'm a, I'm a mere mortal while you are like a god. So I'm trying to get all my notes. But before we get out of here, I'm going to ask a fact. I put it on Facebook. I said, what do you want me to ask Steve? And I love it. My buddy said this, and I think this is great. Which MotoGP rider would you be too scared to go out partying with? You'd be too scared to go out partying with. You'd be like, oh, God, no, I, I can't. I've got a family. I mean, what, what MotoGP rider would you be too scared to go partying with? Which MotoGP rider? Scared as in, as, in, as in what? Scared as in you don't have bail money and, like, and you got to get back. Like your plane leaves in like two hours. That, like, hey, listen, local authorities, oh. I, I didn't mean to do that, but I got to get back. Please let me go. Please get my passport back, please. Um, oh wow, Moto GP rider, Moto GP wow. rider, Moto GP, or any of them out of the three classes. Who's the one rider you go, No, I can't party with you. I got a family, I live a different life now. I would say probably Jack Miller, to be honest with you. Jack, I love Jack, yeah, <laughs> calm down a hell of a lot. Um, and maybe he wouldn't be the same, but I think deep down in his roots, like, um, and that would be some party. And, and we've had a party with his parents. And man, that was crazy. <laughs> I, bet it was. I love it. I thought you'd say Miller, but you never know. You could have pulled out a surprise for me. I never knew. Okay. So we got Miller. And real quick, like, if you could summarize 
and it's not final yet, but do you think Paul goes to HRC and, and how's that going to work out? Do you think? Um, that's an interesting one because when that rumor first started, I was just, I batted it away and thought, Hey, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, but it got stronger and stronger. And for me, I think that it's likely to happen. I think it's likely to happen. And I think that it would be harsh on Alex Marquez, but he's such a, an aggressive rider. He, he could get something out of the Honda. Um, let's, you know, not being disrespectful to Paulus Bargaro, I've written an article about him recently. He's not someone who you would imagine at the moment could win you a MotoGP World Championship, but he can definitely get you podiums. And if you want someone to ride a Honda the way Mark rides a Honda, then look no further. I mean, the guy just absolutely frazzles the bike. I mean, he just rattles the brains out of everything he touches. Yes. So it could, it could work. It could work. Um, but there's there's still a few seats here and there that we've got to work out what's happening with that person. Now, saying it does happen, do you think that pisses Mark off and he goes, okay, I'm going to reduce that four-year contract and I'm going to go someplace else after the first year? Because I mean, he won't say it publicly and he'll put on a good face because that's what Mark does, that's what champions do. But do you think by them not giving – and it's true, they didn't, they didn't give Alex a good shot. It's almost like that movie Friday. How do you get fired on your day off? And that's what it's like. He didn't get a, he didn't get a chance to prove himself. I mean, lap times and testing don't mean anything. And all of a sudden, you got a new guy coming in, and he's already out. Why do I even turn the wheel in anger? Well, you, you're right. I mean, I, I mean, if it did really, really annoy Mark, he, he would not let that show. And and he was he's going to be asked that, of course, as soon as we go, if that gets an act. Um, and and he will not show that he's annoyed about it, but. I don't know. I mean, I don't know how hard it is to get out of contracts these days, but it's Mark Marquez, and maybe it would. I mean, I, hey, I think everybody would love to see what Mark could do on another bike. So, yes, I'm going to uh, with absolutely don't. I've got some friends at HRC, and so I'm not meaning this in a disrespectful manner, but for for the show, I'd love to see him on another bike. Yeah, I, w- I would too. I mean, he has nothing but, to yeah, prove. Yeah, of that that would annoy him for sure. I think it's going to be interesting. I, I honestly, I would love to see him in a Ducati. I like to see him in a, in a KTM or a Ducati, and and more so the KTM, just because you know they're up and comers, and to him, they go to a, the KTM and kind of stick it to each. Oh, that would be beautiful, wouldn't it? That would oh, uh, that would be amazing. That would be the one. That would be the one that I'd, I'd I'd really like to see him go to because I I think that with Ducati, honestly, give him a weapon like that, and <sighs> we could be trouble than we're in right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no. <laughs> no. It's like giving a serial killer like a, a silencer on, on a gun that's never been made. Like, oh my God, no, no. Yeah. no. I'm another weapon? Yeah. No. Yeah. I think <laughs> it's going to be interesting, man. I'm so happy that you took the time to talk to me today. And we didn't get a chance to even get to, I was going to ask you about uh, how, does, how do you look to see it, GP going uh, without Rossi because the end is he's closer to the end than he is the beginning unfortunately and I wrote a piece how saying unfortunately and I love and I, I hope he proves me wrong I really really do but I just see it and he even said it in a way almost where he goes you know during the quarantine or whatever I spent a lot of time with my girlfriend I realized you know she's the one I want to have a kid with she's the one I want to I mean I, I don't know if he said Mary but I know he really enjoyed being time with her and spending time with family and this time he's usually traveling and I think He's got to the point, I think Rossi's like, okay, I, it's, like, it's like the Bob Seger song. He realized he just don't need it all. And I think it's like maybe this year, even though they're talking to him going to the, the Patronus team, I kind of see him, if the results aren't there by, by maybe the third or fourth, I kind of see Rossi bowing out this year, which would, which would be terrible for people around the world because he doesn't get the goodbye that he definitely deserves. But how do you see this playing out with Rossi? Yeah, I mean, I've always got the impression that he he, he won't finish until he's he's bored of racing. Um, I think with with quarantine, it's kind of got kind it's kind of got in everyone's soul that you know do you know what hanging out at home is not so bad after all. Yeah. Um, so whether he feels differently when he gets back to the racing again, I think is definitely going to be completely results driven. Um, if that guy gets on the podium, and this is Rossi, we're talking. Yes. Possible. Um, that will change everything, and he is not going anywhere for another year, in my opinion. Yeah, but struggles 
and there were a few races at the end of last year where he did, um, then yeah, you might be right. I mean, he might well just say, hey, you know what, it life's too short and, and I want to do something a little bit different. I mean, I personally hope selfishly that he, he's definitely got one more year in him. Yeah. You know, I really, really, but we'll have to wait and see. And hey, if, if there's lots more to catch up on, we can always do it in the winter because I'll have loads of time. Oh, I love it. Man, I, I got to go, Steve. Again, right. thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Honestly, I, man, when, when I hit you up with the message, I go, I think he'll do it. And you said, yeah. And I honestly, I jumped like a little schoolgirl. I was like, yes! I was so happy. And you know me, so you know that I, I wasn't far from the truth. I was like, yes! And I jumped up and I said, so thank you, thank you, thank you for your time. For everything, I look forward to seeing you on the broadcast this year. I'm so in two weeks. I can't wait to listen to you and Matt kill it on the air like you always do. Thank you so much. Good luck with the move. Uh, give Charlie and your wife my love. And, man, I will see you when I see you, buddy. Stay safe. Thank you so much, Steve. I appreciate you, buddy. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure at any time. And uh, I'm sure I'll speak to you over the course of the season. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Steve. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for watching Tales from the Gemini with BT and Mr. Steve Day from MotoGP. Just made my whole day. Thank you guys for watching. And again, like we always say, peace.